Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for attending our um, um, collaborated uh, seminar, webinar uh, with Confronte and Rakitu. Uh, myself, I'm Dish Patel, uh, the CEO of Rakitu. We also have Felix here, uh, who's uh, working very closely with Rakitu from the Confronte point of view. Um, and today, um, you know, it's, it's a, an exciting time for us, you know, to be working with Confronte, and we want to really try and help our um, customers, help our audience to really understand how can we truly, truly, you know, protect our sensitive data that is either sitting there in cloud and various mediums. So, you know, during our own journey in Rakitu, you know, we, we've done, uh, I think, a marvelous uh, job in um, helping organizations secure uh, their identities, securing their access via uh, different um, uh, applications, um, and I think it's a natural progression for us um, and, and quite organic to turn around and say, actually, we're going to now help you secure your data. Uh, we've been to the market, we've you know we've looked at various uh, vendors and suppliers that we can work jointly with, um, and seeing that you know um, truly you know to 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 help in all the industries that we're currently working with. Um, um, in the same aspect and be a extension to what we are already offering as a solution, I think uh, Confronte came out to to be the best uh, in terms of also offering that zero trust kind of offering. Um, you know, um, so again, like I mentioned, we have Felix here. Um, he, you know, is very talented um, and and really understands this space uh, throughout. Um, and I think. Um, you know, uh, welcome, Felix. You know, um, uh, I don't know if you, you can say a little bit of an introduction to yourself, and then I think uh, you know I'll hand over to Felix now, and he can pretty much um, explain the solution, how we can address the issues in the industry, um, and and how successfully that, that this has been done uh, throughout. And and like I said, at the end, what we'll do so is we'll take a little bit of a uh, questionnaire throughout. If anybody has does have any questions, please please feel free. Uh, to put them in the chat um, and we can at the end go through those questions, run through them, help answer those, help answer your concerns, anything you may be targeting, anything you may see an opportunity in your in your own environment uh, where we can plug this in um, and any aspect of the offerings that uh, Rakitu are able to give as well. So without a doubt, Felix, it's over to you. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Dash. Um, Few words about myself. Um, I'm working at the product team here at Comforto. I'm um, working for Comforto for uh, more than 10 years. Um, started in the cybersecurity space uh, over a decade ago, and it's yeah, it's it's uh, exciting times at the moment. Really, really interesting um, things are happening uh, in that space. And we just talked about <laughs> with, with that. We just talked about the fact that um, yeah, our last business trips were so while ago. Uh, so we all stuck um, um, in front of screens now. But hopefully um, soon we will be able to have kind of uh, um, um, conversations face to face again, um, where we can have kind of a, a little better intro uh, where we can meet. Awesome. So um, yeah, before we actually start, a few words about Comforter. Uh, we are in that space, in the cybersecurity space, for more than 20 years. We um, help companies to embrace data-centric security. We have um, um, large enterprises as our um, target um, customers, um, protecting the um, 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 sensitive data, um, sensitive information for, for example, the three largest credit card brands in the world. Um, and with that, we, we, we see a lot of needs and we see a lot of um, movements in the market that um, show the need for data security and data centric security is, is, is bigger than ever before. And uh, that brings me actually to the first um, slide, which is talking about the facts uh, of kind of the three different um, waves that we see um, in the market. And the majority of our customers uh, share a common set of, of uh, obstacles and needs. Um, one reason um, um, they, they, they look at data security is um, they are not just migrating data and applications to the cloud, but they are actually transforming um, um, their overall organization um, and application architecture, meaning um, that they, they want to take advantage of, of modern cloud native um, architectures, DevOps processes, that kind of culture. Um, and that is a, a big shift for a lot of enterprises, and especially um, with larger enterprises, there's a lot of legacy technology in place. Um, they need to migrate. Um, 
And, and we see that uh, um, even being accelerated by the pandemic situation that we have now. Another reason is that uh, those organizations, um, they want to move more quickly. Um, and that's the middle picture here. They don't want to move like a, um, on, on a snail's pace, if, if we will, um, but, but rather they want to be hyper agile um, and responsive to, to dynamic market forces, meaning being able to change applications depending on market needs, um, exchange part of the application, for example, a web app or um, um, a mobile app, um, just to make sure they can um, uh, fulfill the customer needs. And the third way, the third reason um, is that um, kind of is a compliance related reason. Yeah, um, the, the sheer amount of data that, that those organizations are processing, um, the shift to um, data analysis tools that, that, that make use of machine learning technologies, uh, um, AI, if we <laughs> would mention the buzzword term, modern engineering architectures, um, the need for speed that we talked about, they all work against those compliance efforts, um, which can be barriers, yeah? meaning um, there might be a compliance team telling you, hey, um, that project um, you want to do in the cloud, you want to send the data to the clouds, that's not what we can do because um, of this privacy regulation, we have to make sure that the data is protected and it doesn't look like we can do that. Or on the other way around, uh, what we also see in, in, in some enterprises is that the agility pressure is so big that they are actually making the move, um, they are building those new applications, and then um, a CISO or a cybersecurity team um, is facing the challenge that they have to um, bring in security as an afterthought because the data is already um, in those environments. And one of the biggest challenges, um, if we summarize that, is we have the data privacy, we want to make sure that the data is protected, um, and we have the kind of infrastructure complexity, um, especially with hybrid or multi-cloud strategies. We see that kind of complexity, that, that kind of place um, against our needs to, to uh, fulfill data privacy needs. So what can we actually do to make sure that the data is protected? One thing that, that is happening quite often is um, organizations are looking at their current stack of how they can protect sensitive information. And what they find is that those controls are usually not working, um, especially with that kind of hyper accelerating uh, technology ecosystem that we see. Um, um, those controls can be kind of a non-fit. Yeah? Um, applications data are so transient now, um, they are changing and moving so rapidly. Um, they're one moment in the cloud um, and another moment in the data center, meaning um, especially with the microservices architecture, you can uh, play around um, quite a bit. Um, but for our cybersecurity teams, our compliance teams, that is a true challenge because it's hard to get hold of where the sensitive data actually is and how to protect it. Um, the traditional control, uh, controls that, that come with modern cloud platforms, um, they kind of seem that like they are from a prior generation. Um, we hear a lot of comments from, from CISOs and um, um, a lot of comments from um, cloud um, application owners um, that what comes um, with those kind of platforms is not um, state of the art or doesn't solve the main issue, which is kind of protecting data in a holistic end-to-end -end way. Yeah? Um, in addition to that, um, if you think about the tools that are available on premises, they not necessarily work in the cloud as well. So what we see is a lot of silos being built uh, and a lot of different systems to manage. And we see that from a privileged account access management, identity access management perspective. Uh, we also see that from a data security perspective. For example, you have that encryption solution for your Oracle databases on premises. You have another encryption solution in the clouds. Um, a third one with a different cloud vendor, and that becomes a mess to manage. Um, and in addition to that, uh, what we also see is a lot of companies have false trust with cloud vendors, meaning um, they think that the data is secure, whereas if we look at the contracts and if we look at the real kind of uh, small written <laughs> contractual notes, um, actually the responsibility for protecting the sensitive information is with the customer. It's, it's really with the organization that is processing and um, owning the data. Um, and that brings us to kind of the big question, which is how can we actually make sure that the data is secure, that we comply to regulations, um, that we make sure that uh, uh, we have data privacy, uh, even if we have a multi-cloud or hybrid strategy uh, with a lot of different technologies. And one of the suggestions that um, Forrester and Gardner 
uh, are bringing to the table in the past years is to adopt data-centric security. Um, so what does data-centric security essentially mean? If we think about data security, a lot of people think about classic encryption. Yeah? So data security, we do encryption, easy, data is protected. Forrester and Gardner say the problem is bigger than that, and we need to look at data security from a, a wider uh, perspective, meaning it's actually about understanding the data, uh, making sure that you know where your data is, where it comes from, who's using the data, to being able to control the policies, um, creating policies that actually make sense. And you can only do that if you understand the data landscape. Then you only can create policies that fit to your business um, processes and use cases. Then, of course, being able to protect the data, but using newer technologies that are not coming with the limitations that we had with um, traditional controls. And then, of course, and that's a very important point, being able to deploy the overall thing in a way that um, makes sense. For example, we, we, um, if we want to protect data, it's not just kind of changing the data. It's really um, making sure that you have um, the integration with your existing cybersecurity solutions, for example, IAM, where you're now able to control who's actually allowed to deprotect the data or who is allowed to get access to the sensitive information, to ZM systems where you want to uh, monitor, where you want to understand what is happening with your data protection solution but also the integration into your existing applications because the best concept on this world doesn't make sense if you're not able to actually implement it in your environment, if you're not able to implement it in your existing infrastructure, uh, in your existing applications. So before we now talk about what we actually as a company do, I would like to take a little um, um, journey to how can we actually change the data uh, in a way that is better than what we had before? What is the kind of game changer here? Um, and if we think about different protection methods that we used in the past, um, a lot of companies are using VLE, volume level encryption. In fact, volume level encryption is great if somebody gets access to your data center, steals the hard disk, Mission Impossible style, runs away with it, then the hard disk is protected. That's great. Uh, but as soon as you unlock the hard disk to work with the data, uh, unlock the system, what is happening if an attacker gets access to that on a digital level, he can see the clear text data. So volume level encryption is not a good choice when it comes to actually implementing data-centric security when we want that the security travels with the data, um, that we make the data worthless to attackers. The second option a lot of companies are talking about when they talk about data security is masking. And masking is great if we want to protect the data on the presentation layer, meaning if an employee or a customer isn't allowed to see the clear text data, on um, the fly, we can mask the data and make sure that those elements that need to be protected um, aren't available. Uh, and we all know what masking is. We have all seen our credit card number, for example, and only the last four digits being in the clear. Um, that's great. But if we apply masking to our um, actually um, our production environment, our production databases, that wouldn't work because we would destroy the meaning, we would destroy the data, and it becomes worthless for us if we want to process it. So masking is not the right choice when it comes to data-centric security. So let's take a look at what happens if we um, apply classic encryption. If you look at a typical data set, PII data in this case, we have a first name, last name, um, we have an ID, for example, a primary account number, we have an email address. What happens if we apply classic encryption? First of all, what we see here is the data is secure, and that's great. Um, um, no attacker would be able to misuse that data. Unfortunately, we aren't able to use the data. So with classic encryption, even if it is on, on a field level in a database, what we always need to do is we need to deprotect the data to process it um, and to, to analyze it and to work with it. Which brings us to the fact that we actually need to have a complex um, infrastructure that supports our protection and deprotection mechanisms and that um, make, basically make sure um, that only those who are allowed to can deprotect the data. But we have a lot of places now where we actually need to deprotect the data. In addition to that, um, the format of the data changes drastically, meaning applications um, and databases not necessarily are able to actually um, use the encrypted data, but rather have to work on the clear text elements. And we see that with a lot of customers. Um, we just recently um, um, onboarded a new customer, uh, which is a large insur insurance company in the US. They collect a lot of different data sets from different subsidiaries 
uh, and they want to bring all of that together. They are correlating the data for, for data analytics, making predictive analytics, um, incorporating weather data, kind of really interesting use case. One of the main issues is they had to run on clear text elements uh, because a lot of solutions weren't able to deal with the encryption um, solutions that they had in place. Uh, and that results essentially in uh, privacy issues. And one of the main drivers for them to look for a new protection solution uh, was a new privacy violations that forces them to, to protect the data wherever it is stored. So let's take a look at, at a modern way to protect sensitive information, um, which is tokenization, anything that is format preserving um, a protection. So what happens to a data set if we apply tokenization? Um, and the great thing here is on the, on the first glimpse, we can see that the data from the formats didn't change. So uh, first of all, applications and databases can work on protected data. And that changes drastically how we can um, yeah, make sure that we reduce the exposure risk. Because uh, we basically can say um, any application and database can now run on protected data and even can process uh, protected data. The second thing um, that is happening here is um, we can um, work with the protected data by keeping parts of it in the clear, for example. If you look at um, um, this example here, for example, we, we, we kept the first name in the clear. Um, that might be great for analytics purposes. Also for the uh, primary count number here, we were able to keep the last four digits in the clear, uh, which helps us with authorization. So imagine you have a customer support and they need to authorize a credit card user. Um, they, for example, get the token instead of the clear text element. And what they can do is by seeing the last four digits, they can authorize the end user, the customer, but they never get actual access to the real data element. Meaning if a call center agent runs away with the data, um, an insider attack, for example, um, he wouldn't be able to do anything with that. Um, and the third um, and very important thing um, that we can see here is um, by keeping the meaning, keeping the correlation between a token and the clear text element, um, it's also possible to run analytics um, that basically um, yeah, make sure that there's the same statistical distribution. Um, which brings us to the um, interesting fact that um, even data analytics environments can run on protected data. But that's not the only benefit that comes from protecting data in that kind of modern way. And we are talking about structured and semi-structured data here, of course. Um, one of the big benefits comes also from the model we implement, uh, we use to implement data security. So when we think about classic encryption, uh, what we usually did is we um, gave keys to those parties, applications, users, who needed to get access to the data. Um, and we have basically two sides of the spectrum. Either we have one key for the entire enterprise, which is easy to manage, but if someone gets access to that key, you have a big issue because they can see all the data. On the other end of the spectrum, we have um, hundreds and thousands of keys uh, for every single user application process, which gives us a lot of control because we can exchange keys, we can make sure that they have only limited um, access to specific parts um, uh, of data, um, but this is a mess to manage. Um, and a good example is the Marriott Starwood breach where um, yeah, they weren't sure if the keys were stolen with the data, and then it doesn't make sense to have encryption at all because if you leave the key to your safe on the safe, we all know that doesn't make sense. Another issue with um, that kind of model where we distribute the keys or distribute the, um, um, yeah, where, we, where we give away the kind of control is if a, an attacker um, gets access to a key, we are not necessarily able to see what is happening with the data. We are not as necessarily able to control. And that brings a big issue. You know? On the other end, if we use a central access model, if we use a solution that basically takes care of the protection and deprotection operations, um, we get back a lot of control. Because whenever someone wants to get access to um, sensitive data, what they need to do is they need to contact the solution. And the solution is now able in real time to check if the rights um, are set up correctly um, with integration into your, into your IAM um, system. Um, and you can basically in real time decide if that user application or process is allowed to get access to the sensitive information. Uh, on the other end, you, have, you get a lot of visibility into what is actually happening with the sensitive data. Um, because with every protection and deprotection operation, there's a lock entry that you can monitor. And combine that with uh, a smart auditing system, combine that with smart IAM, 
um, you will get a lot of control over what is happening with sensitive data in your environment. So that brings us back to what does Comforter actually offer to our customers? Um, how do we help um, our customers? Um, first of all, um, we have a platform that basically covers the entire process of data-centric security. Uh, with our discovery and classification solution, we help uh, enterprises to understand their data landscape. And if you look at traditional ways to do that, there was basically a snapshot approach, um, DLP type approach, meaning um, you created a snapshot of how the data landscape looked like, um, and then you were kind of sure of where what type of sensitive data was. The issue is if we look at now at a modern enterprise, if we look at kind of what is happening in the clouds, uh, things are changing quite drastically and, and very fast. Uh, we need a solution that actually um, stays up to date um, by itself and that is automated. And that's what we do. We make sure that we um, check the network, we identify positive uh, repositories that are possible, possibly holding uh, sensitive information, and then we allow you to scan those repositories and get a clear picture of what data is stored. The next step is the inventory. Um, we help you to um, create an inventory that um, is um, up to date, um, that helps you to identify where is sensitive data, what sensitive data needs to be protected, what is happening with that data, is there data that goes off to a third party. Um, you, can, you can see that clearly. But also from a privacy perspective, what you can see now is what data do we have of an individual, for example. And if you get a data subject access request, it's, it's fairly easy to um, kind of create that report and give away kind of the knowledge or the, the report of what data do we have and where it is stored. With that knowledge, you can create the policies that make sense, and then we help you to enforce those policies. So we offer multiple different protection methods, um, making sure that the data um, stays protected um, as much as possible, um, depending on, on what you need. We have uh, masking, we have classic encryption, we of course have tokenization, the um, protection method I just talked about. And, and you can basically decide how the data needs to be protected, uh, and you get a lot of control back. Which brings me to one of the main USPs, which is the deployment part. Making sure that we integrate um, fairly easy with um, IAM solutions, where you can now um, decide what is happening with the data, who has the right to access sensitive data. But also the part that is all about integrating this into your applications. Um, and as we learned that a lot of applications and databases might be able to only run on protected data, and our customers are usually uh, pretty uh, uh, surprised on, on about how, how many applications and databases don't ever need access to clear text um, data, but can um, solely run on, on protected data. But we also make sure that at those places where you need access, um, the integration is as easy as possible. Um, meaning we have a lot of transparent integration capabilities where we intercept streams, where we make sure that the protection uh, happens independent of the actual application. You don't have to change it, uh, which usually, especially for the larger enterprises we are working with, is a big deal. Uh, because that would require a lot of development uh, resources. And if we now think about the cloud and um, um, the, the agility movement that I talked about at the beginning of the presentation, um, especially the DevOps culture that we, um, that we see in a lot of enterprises, what is for us really important is that you can monitor, that you can manage, that you can automate, orchestrate our solution also from the CICD, making sure that the development team um, doesn't have to call the IT team for any changes or for data protection um, 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 yeah, requirements, but really is able to use this solution um, in their environment and making sure that the data security is there by design, which is one of the key GDPR uh, uh, requirements. So at the end, let's let's briefly look how that in, looks like in, a, in an actual use case. And uh, what we see here is uh, a slide that, that came up with from one of our customers, uh, um, a, a payments processor, Mercury Payments Processing, now part of the Nets Group. Um, and what is clear, what we want to do in the end, we want to make sure that we protect the data as early as possible um, by integrating at the edge. We also want to understand where the data sensitive data comes from by uh, discovering the data. Uh, if we do that, um, we can have a lot of systems, a lot of places uh, actually running on tokens. Um, could be the cloud, uh, could be our um, uh, cloud services, um, could be any application, um, could be databases, logs, backups. Uh, we want to make sure that um, the tokens are used as much as possible instead of the clear text element. And that basically results in a 
area where we only use protected data, which is great because this reduces the exposure drastically. Um, if, some, if an attacker gets access to the sensitive information um, um, or that is protected with tokenization, um, it's worthless. And if we look at GDPR, um, for example, um, there is no obligation to disclose a breach if you protect the, the data adequately, um, meaning you get rid of the complete overhead of, of managing the PR, managing the kind of data breach if there is no real data breach, if you make sure that an incident doesn't even become a data breach by making sure that the data, um, the sensitive data is not stolen. Of course, at some places you need to deprotect the data. And one of the rules is we want to unprotect only when it's absolutely necessary and manage the access. So this is when um, IAM solutions come into play, uh, where it's a perfect fit, um, where we now have control over the data, we get the visibility, um, we get the real-time control, and then we integrate that with our IAM solution and can really manage the access. And of course, you have outside communication and you can use, uh, for example, encryption if you need to send out uh, protected data according to um, whatever the regulations um, state um, or require you to, to do uh, when you share data with third parties. All right, and with that, I think there are a lot of questions. This was a really fast uh, um, run through. Um, usually we have a lot of technology questions. How does it actually work? Um, how can we make sure um, um, that uh, um, our data is accessible? What about availability? Um, and those are really great questions and we are happy to, to answer them either in a private conversations, reach out to Rakatu, uh, or um, yeah, um, checking out our website. That's, uh, that's also always a great choice. And with that, yeah, back to you, Dush. Hey, excellent. Th thanks very much, Felix. Uh, that was a great run and an introduction into how we can better secure our data. You know, that's the fundamental thing. As I mentioned, you know, um, at, at Rakitu, we're providing great solutions to customers in order to protect their access, protect their identities. Uh, and a perfect fit to this is now protecting the data. So, you know, you're able to uh, fill that gap that we had as a requirement from our customers. Um, and and I hopefully, you know, th those guys that have attended here have now had that briefing um, and have a clearer understanding of this. So, um, look, uh, we've had some questions come through as well. So let me go ahead and and, and hopefully we can answer this, uh, you know, uh, these questions. So so you mentioned, um, so there's a question, really good question here, uh, that, that Confronte, you know, we may have some audiences who've never heard of Confronte, never even heard of us. But what we want to try and demonstrate is, is there's a question that which is there any large companies that you have existingly deployed successfully Confronte and, and are you uh, able to give some scenarios on this you know so uh, are you able to help there Felix where we've helped? Absolutely so we have a few uh, case studies on our website um, where we actually have uh, a real names assigned to <laughs> it's as I just mentioned uh, Mercury payments processing for example Nets um, we have a lot of companies that, as it is true with, with um, cybersecurity solution, as always, uh, don't want us to mention their name officially. Um, as I said, we are protecting the data for the three largest credit card in, uh, brands in the world. If you are stopping by at um, um, yeah at the uh, gas station, um, <laughs> we protect sensitive information for a lot of gas stations. We have um, the largest uh, retailers uh, in the U.S. Um, being our customers. Uh, and with that, I think uh, we can also have a, a conversation about that um, on, a, on a personal note. Yeah. Okay. So we've got another another great question here. So how does the data discovery part actually work? So so you know a customer from this, from this it sounds like the customers come along and they said we because we have a similar thing in in the Pam side of things. You know we have to discover assets. We have to discover the inventory. So from this it sounds like how how are you we discovering? Uh, the data itself that that is vulnerable or that needs protecting? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, that could be answered in a <laughs> fairly long technology discussion. Um, first of all, a lot of discovery solutions out there, as I said, are working with a DLP type approach or are just scanning those repositories that we already know we had. Meaning, um, <laughs> for example, there is a workshop. Um, we bring all the administrators, um, all the database admins together and we kind of create that picture. Um, the issue with that is that doesn't necessarily find those places that you didn't know existed. Um, and another issue that comes with that is that um, 
um, you kind of create a snapshot yeah, that is true for now, but maybe is not true anymore uh, tomorrow. So our approach is different. We actually scan the network, um, trying to find those pieces uh, of sensitive information that are flying around. Uh, and with that, we create a map um, of all the repositories and file systems that um, possibly contain sensitive data. And with that map, you're now able to really scan um, those candidates um, that could hold sensitive information. And we do that for structured and unstructured data, meaning Amazon S3 buckets, meaning um, file repositories, meaning databases, of course. Um, and with that picture, you're now able to yeah, decide which repositories I want to scan. And then we start the scanning process where we now get really deep um, and, and um, detailed information about what data is actually in those repositories. But the step that is kind of making sure that we find the unknown unknowns, um, this is for us the, the crucial part, because a lot of our customers we talked to said, I really like the protection bit, I just don't know if, where, where my sensitive data is. And so we, we're trying, uh, um, or we, we're helping companies um, um, to solve that issue. Yeah, yeah no, that's great. So that, that sort of, um, uh, the, 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 the real line is, and, and where Rakitu, I think, can really work strong is, we already, when we do our own discovery as part of the IAM and PAM, um, there is always a discovery phase. There is always a phase where we're saying, trying to understand what is it you're trying to protect? Are you trying to protect the user accounts? Are you trying to protect the assets and the inventory? And, and at the granular level, it's now that same question. And then again, what works really well is all everything going in together uh, as a solution saying, okay, within those systems, what data are you trying to protect? And how can we best do that? Because ultimately, and as you mentioned, I think um, um, in this is that, you know, uh, having the data and insider threats is a big thing at the moment. You know, we're, we're, we're having a lot of users um, of using bring your own devices, you know, remote access, VPNs. They're connecting from, you know, all kinds of machines, right? And, and really, um, as, as much as uh, an organization can secure the access and, and the uh, side to that side, how can they truly say that the data hasn't been removed and the integrity is still there? So, so on, on that side, you know, how does the actual, there's another question on actually on integrity that brings it into here as well. So I've got all the list of here. Um, how does the um, transparent integration look like uh, in, in all of this solution? Yeah, so, so that's, that's also a good one. Um, I mean, we have a multitude of applications um, using different protocols. We have um, so many different databases um, and what is the key here is um, finding those places that are in control of the data or where a lot of data travel through, for example, like Apache Kafka. This is a place where it's ideal to, to integrate data security, where you have kind of the, the collection of sensitive information, if you will. Um, so we make sure that we have transparent integrators for, for those types of, of um, hubs um, to make sure that the data can be protected at, at the heart um, of the enterprise. Uh, we have also transparent integrators for as a service applications, for example, where you now can basically make sure that the security, the, the data security is invisible for the user. Um, he can simply work um, on the application, but in the middle, we are sitting and making sure that the data is in the um, as a service application only in its protected state and on the fly is deprotected if the user has the access rights to, to actually get access to the data. And then, of course, there are standard protocols um, and standard kind of um, streams that you can intercept um, with technology that is kind of um, valid or, or usable for multitude of different applications um, that are using those standard protocols. That's also where we integrate. But of course, we also have APIs um, to make sure you can use the application um, if you want to integrate it via a development approach. So there's a, a multitude of things. I have a long list here. Um, if you're interested in a specific application, um, reach out to us and we can have a kind of technology discussion. I think that's the best approach here. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I think that, you know, we, we're getting quite a few questions coming in. Everyone's getting a, a little bit um, really interested in this. So, so there's one uh, around the actual regulation. So, you know, we all understand that, you know, yes, data protection is quite important. Uh, from from the the way this question is laid, it, it, it's more asking: Is it regulations that determines that you should protect the data in a certain standard, or is it the other way around? People are protecting the data, uh, and then and 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 then regulations come in. So really, it's a uh, from 
uh, and again, I, I think that's where where the question is coming around is what 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 comes first, the chicken or the egg, or what's what's happening here? You know. <laughs> I always tend to say the the, the chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what we see in the market, uh, what we see in the market is um, one of the main drivers is actually regulations. Even if cybersecurity teams think ahead um, to get the kind of um, to get the money to get the budget from the board, there needs to be some pressure. Uh, and usually, privacy regulations are something that that brings that pressure um, even to the board. Um, and then there is also the budget there to to buy solutions that help you to protect the data. Now having cybersecurity regulations in place for quite some time, especially in, 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 in EMEA or where we have GDPR, for example, um, the board is already aware of those regulations. Uh, but then again, there is a lot of pressure coming from, we need to be agile, uh, we need to do this and that in the cloud. Um, and um, kind of there's that kind of uh, conflict. Yeah? Uh, and usually what we see is with those kind of fast moving enterprises, they actually start building an application and bringing in the compliance topic a bit later. Whereas um, those who are kind of aware of the of the issue, and we see that in, in, in Europe quite a bit where, where GDPR had, really has teeth, um, privacy is already in the planning and is already part of the planning phase um, quite early. Uh, and that's great. Uh, I think that's a great, great move, a great move in the right direction, where we now think about privacy from the beginning. Um, and it makes a lot of sense to, to look for solutions that are sustainable, uh, meaning um, whatever is changing in the market, whatever is happening um, in whatever kind of markets you want to penetrate, um, where other regulations are valid, you need to find a solution that covers data security from, from, the, from the ground up. Um, um, and all those privacy regulations usually have some things in common. For example, protecting the data in an adequate way. We see that in any privacy regulation out there. Uh, and if you find a solution that does that, you cover a lot of ground. Um, instead of having siloed solutions or things that only cover parts of your stack or parts of the bigger problem. But I already said too much. <laughs> That's fine. I think what we can do is uh, we can leave it, leave it here for the moment. Uh, you know, there, there are some really interesting questions, and I think what we can do is just um, either relay them back uh, on, on the presentation at some point, or uh, just uh, contact those individuals back um, uh, with the replies on, on those uh, delicate kind of questions, because they're more, not generic, more use case specific um, around their own uh, data protection and how they want to handle things. So we'll, we'll leave them for the moment. I think, um, is there anything else you want to add as a, a final point on this, Felix? And then I think, you know, um, we, we can come to a conclusion on this one as well. Awesome. No, thanks for joining. Um, and yeah, if there are any questions, um, then reach out to Rakatu and we are really happy to help you uh, talking through your specific use case, which I think is, is always important. Having that 15, 30 minute conversation is usually really helpful instead of browsing around the internet and uh, um, trying to find your own answers. I think that's that's all, always something that, that is um, really helpful. And with that, thank you. Thank you for listening. Yeah, th th thanks, Felix, on that. So, so yeah, as, as Felix mentioned, you know, I think um, uh, the, the real way to really, you know, understand this, and as we already do with the IAMS and uh, PAM kind of implementations, is, you know, there's, there's tons of information out there. There's tons of ways of protecting your environment in various ways. Um, and really, you know, let's let's touch base on a more of a one-to-one. -one. Let's do a mini workshop if we need to, um, to really understand your environments. You know, let's let's see what you're really looking for. How you know where are your struggles? What what are you trying to improve here? What are you trying to achieve? Um, so that we can try and see uh, how the solution will best fit your particular use case. So uh, I think look, it's been a, a really good, insightful uh presentation um but hopefully everybody else feels the same way and um by all means yes again any questions do not hesitate please feel free to contact us um uh, and yeah we, we, we will we'll tackle those as and when they come in so um that's it i think um in that case so thank you very much uh everyone have a pleasant day keep safe um you know, we're in a tricky time at the moment um, and, you know, we wish you all the best. Thanks very much.